Good evening, everybody. We're going to get started. I want to welcome you to uh, the ZOA webinar this evening on the situation on the campuses. Uh, my name is Steve Feldman. I'm executive director of the Greater Philadelphia Chapter of the Zionist Organization of America. I hope everybody is doing well this evening. Uh, and thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, I want to begin by thanking uh, my colleagues, Alan and Sharona, for working behind the scenes tonight and helping everything run smooth. I also want to welcome and say hi to my colleagues, Susan and Stuart and Nancy and others who are here. Thank you very much for joining in tonight. Also, I want to thank and say hello to our board members and officers, uh, both of our chapter and to National ZOA. So welcome everybody. I want to uh, remind everybody at the outset that ZOA is a nonpartisan organization. And if you uh, take advantage of the chat room, please keep your comments on the topic and please keep them civil. Uh, thank you in advance for that. Uh, if time permits, uh, later in the event, we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, we'll try and do it in the chat room. Uh, please mark your questions with the word question. So they will stand out uh, as questions rather than comments. America's campuses are uh, often a minefield for Jewish students and other pro-Israel students. And tonight, we're going to take a look at some of those who are planning the mines and offer some advice and action items for you and those you know to try and improve things. Here to guide us through um, this topic and what's happening on the campuses are uh, three of my colleagues, and I'm honored to have them as, our, as my colleagues and my colleagues' colleagues. Jonathan Ginsberg, Ward Taylor, and Marlene Artov. Jonathan is Managing Director of ZOA's Campus Department, and he uh, supervises the New England and West Coast campuses for ZOA. Uh, Ward Taylor is the Associate Campus Director. He oversees the Mid-Atlantic and Southeast United States campuses. And Marlene Artov uh, deals with the Tri-State campuses and the Midwest campuses. So I want to welcome my colleagues uh, and look forward to what you have to say. Uh, Orr is going to begin things with, with an overview, and then he's going to be speaking about uh, J Street U. So Orr, take it away. Thank you so much, Steve, and thanks everyone for showing up tonight and uh, joining us on this really important topic. So I just wanted to give a overview and some background about what we and the students that we work with are facing on campus. Really, I want to start with why campus is so central. Really, it's central because this is where intellectual movements begin across the country. This is where people form identities in a really crucial moment in their lives. It's where they form communities that they're gonna have for the rest of their lives, whether that's fraternities or any of the other social groups that they're gonna be in. It's also where they form their ideology that most people don't change for the rest of their life. Um, and it's where the future leaders and followers that we have in our society come from. So it's supposed to be a place for intellectual debate and those first impressions and really those emotional impressions matter more. And this is no doubt a topic where that is extremely important. When we think about the campus environment, it's important to think about the context that it comes from. It's not just that we were dropped into this BDS debate out of nowhere. There's a long history of exclusions, limits on Jewish students, bias in the population. And that's been for you know over a hundred years in America. And the modern anti-Israel movements, they really see themselves as the inheritors of a lot of the civil rights movement. They see themselves as the inheritors of the South Africa anti-apartheid movement, the anti-war movement. And as you see, like we're in a very protest, um, a protest environment right now. And a lot of that comes from the campuses. So whether that is on issues of race relations in this country, whether that's about sexual assault, harassment, awareness, um, immigration, student debt cancellation, any of those things, like those movements really see their, their starting point in the campus environment. And they try to tie themselves all together so that they have stronger alliances. So we have the, the rise of identity politics and intersectionality. Intersectionality, for those who are not aware, is the basic idea is that each layer of a person's identity can help understand how that person experiences power and oppression. And how we experience that on campus is generally that there are alliance groups between pro-Palestinian groups and other minority groups 
and oftentimes those exclude Zionist voices. So Linda Sarsour is a really good example of that, saying things like there's no such thing as a feminist Zionist, and that if you're against any type of oppression, that you have to be against colonialism, imperialism, and then Zionism is always added to that list. So students face a lot of structural fact factors that make it very difficult to speak out. A lot of those can be just general. In America, we have free speech protections. Um, social media is a great platform for the spreading of conspiracy theories, and um, that's incredibly important and often tied to anti-Semitism. And then in academia, there's so much institutional support for um, much more left-wing ideologies that you see that in the administrations, professors, and even in some of the Jewish institutions. Um, so Jewish students who have strong Zionist ideals can often feel isolated and feel that social pressure not to be the strongest advocates that they can be. And so right now in America, we see some of the highest rates of reported anti-Semitism, especially on campuses. And that pervades a lot of the students' social spheres, academic spheres, what their life in the classroom and outside is like. And so ZOA gives them a lot of the tools to empower them, to allow them to speak what they really believe and change those, those minds, change that environment. And we'll get into more of the ZOA programs as we get later into the program. So I wanted to start off uh, first with, you know, I would say the least of our problems and not to say that that isn't a, a big problem, um, but just starting in the least radical organization that is often an obstacle to peace um, in, in the campus environment. And so we're gonna start with J Street and J Street bills itself as pro-Israel. I don't think you can say that about some of the other organizations that we're gonna talk about. Um, they build themselves as pro-Israel, pro-Palestinian and pro-peace. So it's very easy for people to um, get on board with those ideas as being so positive. And oftentimes Jewish students will see that as the moderate center of the road opinion, especially with how the two state um, mentality has just really conquered the, the middle of the road of the establishment. And so, but it really places a really problematic moral equivalence between Israel, the PA, even Israel and Hamas, um, Israel and a lot of its neighbors where we know that there is no real moral equivalence but J Street presents it as if there is such. And it's really a narrow view that this is a completely land-based dispute and it places uh, things totally in those terms when there's so much more to it, ignoring Israeli security, secu uh, security concerns. And when you get to J Street U, which is J Street's campus wing, they even oftentimes will drop the pro-Israel part of their slogan and just see themselves as much more of a Jewish-based, Israel-based, even pro-Palestinian, pro-peace group. And that can be really problematic for people who are not so informed and also for Jewish institutions like Hillel that are going to house all of these different um, movements. And that can be very difficult for building consensus and uh, among the Jewish community. Um, and I'd say one of the biggest examples that I bring up when I say, when people don't know too much about J Street and um, they just read their slogans and get on board with them is that even at J Street's own conference, there was, um, there was a moment a few years ago where Tsipi Livni was speaking and she said, at least we can all agree that we all support the IDF and the crowd audibly booed her. And so even if they have purported goals that might be admirable on their like, you know, one inch deep level of, of thinking, much deeper than that, the organization is a tool of so much more criticism of Israel that it can hardly be called a pro-Israel organization. And that can be extremely problematic. Um, so of course we can get more into that as we get into the program, but um, I'd like to turn it over to Jonathan to talk about some of the other organizations. Thank you, Or, for that excellent summary, and it's great to be here with everyone. Thank you so much. Um, to piggyback a little bit on what Or was discussing about J Street, um, I want to focus on the organization If Not Now, which uh, represents a space um, more significantly to the left than J Street, uh, if you can believe that. Um, if not now, uh, for those who might not be familiar, was founded during Operation Suketan in the summer of 2014 with the specific intention of protesting 
the IDF's actions there. Um, I remember myself um, being in Israel, living there, um, and being in Tel Aviv during that summer. And also, I had finished my IDF service a long time ago, but seeing on social media the way that If Not Now was presenting uh, the overall picture to their audience, uh, I saw how incredibly distorted it was. And it was very, very clear that their main agenda was to uh, defame Israel, to not provide context to the full situation of what was happening on the ground, and clearly to act in a very, very biased agenda. Their, their base um, of leadership, overwhelmingly progressive-minded young Jews, um, and they claim to represent Jewish social justice, tikkun olam, um, and those values, and they're entirely grassroots oriented. So they do have a significant appeal for a lot of college students in that sense. I think they, you know, J Street, in a sense, is still more, can be considered part of the general, um, you know, left of center establishment, if not now represents um, a more radical view um, to the left. Um, they claim to focus on ending the occupation of the West Bank. They advocate for the removal of all Jews from Judea and Samaria. That's a core part of their platform. However, if we go a little bit deeper at If Not Now and we look at their actions and their statements, um, it really goes a lot beyond that. And they don't restrict their activities just to opposing Israeli policies in Judea and Samaria. Uh, and that's very clear. So in this sense, they're a lot more aggressive and more radical than J Street. Um, one of their major, major um, campaigns in recent years, uh, this began about a year and a half, two years ago, was targeting Birthright Israel and accusing Birthright Israel, um, who doesn't even visit in Judea and Samaria, that their trips do not go there. But just the fact that Birthright provides an opportunity for young Jews to go and experience Israel, to to learn more um, and to connect to their roots in a very Zionist way, uh, if not now, had a big problem with that. Um, and in terms of some of the things that I've witnessed uh, here in the Boston area, um, very, very disturbing things. I remember in the summer of 2017, um, attending Jewish Heritage Night at Fenway Park, If Not Now members came out with a huge banner and they unfurled it. And it was specifically uh, highlighting the complicity, what they believe to be the complicity of the Jewish community in Israel's uh, occupation. Um, so they're very, very, very aggressive. And to me, if that was any other organization, I would say uh, to attend an event based on Jewish Heritage Night that has nothing to do with Israel whatsoever, and to try and link it in some way to uh, support for, for Israel and uh, that sense, to me, that would be described as anti-Semitic. But they do hide behind this uh, tikkun olam stance that they like to present. And it's very, 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 very distorted and biased. They've also done rad radical things such as chaining themselves to the doors of the Israeli consulate of New England in Boston, um, protesting the IDF's actions on the Gaza border. Um, many, many things. Um, I, I've seen the way they work on campus. They're also very closely aligned with um, the remnants of, of the Jewish Bund and the Boston Worker Circle. Um, but they clearly do have an appeal, if not now members, I think represent uh, really the equivalent of, let's say, uh, the kind of constituents who would support Bernie Sanders, young American Jews. They immediately uh, gravitate to one another. Um, and it's, it's something that can be really difficult for college students when they do hear buzzwords about social justice being said and not hearing the full context behind that um, and seeing the way, as Orr mentioned, intersectionality um, links so many of these causes together. Um, you know, young impressionable college students will just, you know, find that very appealing sometimes. And that's why, you know, the, the work that we do at ZOA campus is so important to help provide them with a really strong base of Zionist education to allow them to uh, answer the tough questions and provide you know, hard facts, but more importantly, the ability to share our own narrative. And that's something that I've seen. I see they, they do a very successful job at spreading their narrative, um, often devoid of facts, but uh, you know, we, we need to do the same thing. And I think that's where, you know, thankfully our team, we do such an amazing job. I'm really grateful to, to be working with my colleagues or 
Marlene and everyone at ZOA National, and in particular, Susan Tuckman at ZOA Center for Law and Justice, who does incredible work in helping support Jewish students um, and defending them against anti-Semitism on campus, as we've seen, uh, unfortunately, all too much recently. So that's just a quick summary from me about If Not Now. Um, Jonathan, one, before we go on one second, uh, I mean, I, I've observed some of these groups, and, and If Not Now is almost cult-like with their chanting and, and the marches. Um, can you comment on that a little bit, please? Sure, yeah. I mean, in a sense, uh, If Not Now, is very they're very leftist and populist in that sense. Um, they're very active in the protests we see on the ground right now. Um, they are not as radical as JVP, as Marlene will get to soon, but they, they do a very, very good job of trying to interlink what they claim to be Jewish values, right? And specifically tikkun olam, trying to separate that from Zionism. They don't, I don't think they explicitly claim to be anti-Zionist in terms of they oppose Israel's occupation, but it's similar to J Street. It often varies from leader to leader. Um, you have some, if not now, members who might be, you know, staunchly anti-Zionist. Others might just be, you know, aggressive, sort of, quote-unquote, anti-occupation activists. So it does vary in that sense, but they do a really uh, successful job of sort of linking, um, you know, their, quote-unquote, progressive views. I don't like to use this all the time because, truthfully, I, uh, many of the viewpoints and many of the actions they take are regressive, um, but they do that a lot and that aligns with what we see also from elements of the far left that are prevalent on campus. So I don't, you know, we don't think they particularly represent authentic uh, values of humanism um, at all, but um, they, they do a very good job because things are really uh, just so, let's just say, up, uh, up and down and uh, really backwards in many senses on campuses. Thanks, Marlene. Yes, thank you everyone so much for being here and to my colleagues. Um, I'm just gonna continue talking about um, the most radical and violent organizations that we see on campus, which are JVP and SJP. So JVP stands for Jewish Voice for Peace, which isn't that a great title. Um, they are a Jewish pro-Palestinian group. Um, they are, honestly, they are very small in number. Not every campus even has one, but when they are, the tactics they use come from a different angle. So they are very proud to be Jewish. With that being said, they're often very leftist, um, very secular, or very into like reform, reconstructionist movements. It's very rare to see like a, I mean, I personally never actually seen any Orthodox, modern Orthodox Jew in these groups, but because of that, they have access to all Jewish institutions. So a Hillel will have to give them like rooms to have their meetings in and they can't be like excluded from like, um, I remember when I was at NYU, we did have an SJP there. So for example, um, at the Pittsburgh shooting, NYU held a vigil and it was, it was difficult to make a cause that they shouldn't be represented there because they framed themselves as this Jewish voice, it's often common for them to make statements from a place of moral high ground. So such as, oh, I'm the daughter of, of Holocaust survivors. And so that makes my point against Israel valid. So they are proud of their Jewish identity and they actually manipulate that for the Palestinian, for what they think is the Palestinian cause. And again, the main issue there is they, they end up having um, Jewish institutional support on, on campuses from other Jewish organizations. Um, the other one is SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine. Um, they are, they don't propose a specific solution um, about what they would like to see. They're all about justice in air quotes with that being said from their chants, from their movements, from their leaders and from the national group. Aside from campus, we can see that they don't believe, we can imply they don't believe in the existence of a Jewish state at all, many of their tactics are anti-Semitic. They're very violent while they as a group from an institutional standpoint don't outwardly advocate for violence. There have been many situations on many campuses where there were death threats from individual SGP members. Again, NYU was actually one of them. I remember being a senior and our Hillel was closed for three days because of an SJP member that was like tweeting death threats to Jewish students. Um, they're the ones that are saying Zionism is racism, um, that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. 
Um, and the important thing to know is they actually have an anti-normalization policy. So they're not willing to engage on any level with anyone who has the least bit of Zionist ideology. And that can range from, you know, two-state solution style APAC to somebody who has a pr proud Jewish identity, not to mention um, somebody with strong stances that align with some a great organization like ZOA. Um, they usually achieve their goals through BDS, which stands for Boycott Divestment Sanction. Um, how this usually works is every school, no matter the size, has some kind of student government. So what these groups do is they're able to bring a bill to the floor and voting will work differently on every school. And this bill is asking for a economic divestment from the state of Israel. And that can range on any level from asking to stop importing Jewish products like hummus on, on college campuses in the cafeterias to um, disallowing any kind of study abroad programs with satellite campuses or Israeli universities um, to visa issues to divestment from any kind of Israeli security or technology that the campus might use. So BDS can range depending on the size of the campus and their investment. But the main idea for SJP is JVP on top of, you know, the classic chants of we support the Intifada and, you know, from the river to the sea, which we hear from both of these groups that work together, BDS is their main political arm, and that's how they get their agendas passed on college campuses. All right, I, I have some questions for the three of you, uh, and you could, you know, all answer them or take turns answering them because they're uh, they really are relevant to all the groups that you're talking about. And thank you, by the way, for the excellent presentations about uh, the adversaries of Israel on campuses. Each of these organizations. Um, in some manner or another claims to be pro-Palestinian Arab, but by their activities and their, their talking points, aren't they really just plainly anti-Israel and in some cases anti-Jewish as opposed to quote-unquote pro-Palestinian Arab? So I'd say yes, and I think one of the great things that we do in the campus department is we have our student leadership mission to Israel and we'll bring 35 students two times a year um, in the summer and in the winter to Israel, and they'll be able to see Judea and Samaria for themselves and see economic cooperation that is lifting up actual Palestinians and see how the BDS movement would harm that. In the case of SodaStream, we'll go to that factory and they'll be able to talk to people who would lose their livelihood if the goals of BDS were, uh, were completed in any serious sense. And so I think we're, we're able to push back on that in the people who actually see it. And then they're able to spread that on their campuses through that, that personal experience of they have met with people who would be really hurt by that. And that drives that wedge between people who think being pro-Palestinian means you have to be anti-Israel. Um, and then I think you can just show by the numbers that you know anytime there's been a BDS uh, resolution introduced and passed, there are instances of anti-Semitic um, violence, language, slurs, graffiti, all of those kinds of things are quick to follow. Um, and it creates an environment where if it's okay to target the Zionists, it's okay to target the Jews. And there really is no difference between being anti-Zionist and being anti-Semitic. Thanks. Uh, Marlene or Jonathan, uh, on that topic, uh, anything to add? No? But you're muted, uh, Jonathan. Excuse me, sorry. Um, I'm happy to piggyback on that as well. Um, I think really what we've seen is this uh, push to kind of differentiate anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism on campus. And that's really what, as I mentioned, organizations like If Not Now, JVP specifically are doing. Um, but it's very clear that anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism are undoubtedly interlinked. Um, the denial of Jews to in our ancestral homeland while supporting that right for all other peoples, including Palestinians, that's fundamentally anti-Semitism. Um, and even if it does come from a radical minority that's very, very fringe within the Jewish community, it's very, very important for us to, to stand up loudly and call it out and refute, the, uh, refute these really extreme sentiments um, because the fact that they are Jewish, um, that's something that we can't really uh, control, but uh, they use themselves to really prop up that message. And it's very, very dangerous. And I think 
once uh, the notion of anti-Zionism starts to become normalized on campus, it trickles down to anti-Semitism automatically. And we've seen that in recent BDS resolutions. We've seen that the way that administrations handle anti-Semitic incidents, they certainly do not um, give the same protections to students of other, other backgrounds. And it's very, very problematic. Um, so we're, we're really grateful for Susan Tuckman, as I mentioned before, uh, who does amazing work helping students and for all of our partners in the ProResor community as well. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do this without them. Uh, but ZOA really represents a very, very important space, um, an unapologetic Zionist voice, um, a voice that's backed up you know, through our, our strong lineage, history, um, but also we have the, the, real, the, the human factor, which I think drives everything. Um, it's our staff, it's our ability to um, project the message and to really reach students in an organic way. And I think that's very, very important when it comes to advocacy. Um, as so an 18 year old young Jewish man, young Jewish woman arrives on a campus uh, looking to get involved in some sort of student activity. How do these groups lure and attract Jewish students? Why are so many Jewish students drawn to these groups and how do they draw them? Um, I can touch on that a little bit. I mean, the groups don't use, groups like JVP, they don't necessarily, they don't really have a large membership. It, they use the same ideas of intersectionality and that you're fighting. They, they use, like to use 21st century um, code, like like the popular words of we're, we're fighting for social justice or fighting for human rights. Um, I don't think the danger is their membership. They're usually these groups are not, they're the, the very loud minority on campus. The, what the problem is, is they make it really easy for the majority of not Jewish students to support them and be involved. And again, they do that through the BDS bills, but through other tactics of they don't ask for much, but they ask when it counts. So for example, using a BDS bill that goes to a student government body as an example, they can say like, you know, we've built this coalition with let's say the Black Student Union or the Muslim Students Association or some group that is not directly involved, right? They'll go to this group that they already built a coalition with and they, they basically say, all you have to do to fight for human rights and social justice is just vote yes or no on a particular bill. It's really that easy or come out with us just once a year to this dangerous demonstration and then dangerous demonstration is usually like Yom Hatzma'ud and like a DJ. So ironic that they find that dangerous. Um, so it's not actually that there are a lot of Jewish students that get pulled in. The problem is that they're really able to gain institutional support and, and support from a really wide array of different students that then vote against the Jewish minority on a campus. And with the exception of Yeshiva University in, in New York, Jews, no matter how large in absolute number, are, are, are a small majority on a college campus. And what about If Not Now or J Street U uh, or Jonathan, how do, they, how do they recruit? So I think a lot of their recruitment actually comes from, in the secular Jewish community, a lot of Jews will feel, young Jews will feel an absence of, um, of, of purpose. They want to be involved in these really historic activist movements. They want to, you know, emulate that, the picture of the rabbi marching with Martin Luther King. They want to be that Jew in that space. And so they'll go to these other social movement groups and they'll say, get involved with um, like Black Lives Matter, for, for instance, or an LGBT group. And they'll be seeing that as this is, you know, the modern social justice movement. This is the modern civil rights movement. They'll see it through those terms. And then in those spaces, there will already be um, people who are in, if not now, or J Street, who are showing up as allies to those groups. And they can say, well, if you are a staunch Zionist, you don't have a place in this group. And they will erode that young Jews sense of of Zionism being tied intrinsically to Judaism until they've chipped away at it, until it's just like tikkun olam Judaism left and almost tokeni tokenization Judaism left. That like they're still a Jew when it is convenient to that social group, um, but they're not a Jew in the meaningful sense of religious practice or Zionism or a lot of the, the other cultural hallmarks of our tribe. And so I think that's that's the bigger way. It's kind of they're they're not doing it so directly as you know, um, recruitment campaigns or setting up a table where this is the direct issue. It's through building those alliances that exclude Zionists. Sounds pretty diabolical. 
it's extremely problematic. It's definitely an uphill battle for Zionists, and it's done in a fairly insidious way where it's hard to recognize what's happening at first of why we're losing uh, so many who should be on our side in the next generation. And, and describe uh, for the three of you uh, at the different campuses and the students you work with, how ZOA counters this and ZOA's uh, presence on campuses. So I can, I can speak to some of the campuses that I work with um, and just go through a, a quick list of some recent victories. And I really have to say the Center for Law and Justice, Susan Tuckman, is absolutely crucial in doing these. So uh, I'm not sure level of familiarity, but um, most of you may have heard about the incident at Duke and UNC. There was a whole series of anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist incidences um, a conference that was entirely about BDS um, and the invitation of Linda Sarsour and so many other things. And the, the pressure from the Center for Law and Justice actually got the US to order Duke and UNC to recast the tone of their entire MIDI studies department. Um, at Florida State University, some of you may hear there's a current controversy going on right now where their student government Senate president is a, a very open anti-Semite and is not willing to walk back or listen to any of the opposing views. And so ZOA is working with the students to build coalitions between students, student organizations and alumni uh, to pressure the removal of that president and also to go further than that and to get the uh, IHRA definition of anti-Semitism adopted, which was something that we've done at other universities. We've recently done that at Wake Forest University with the help of Susan Tuckman once again um, to, um, to um, expand the level of exchanges, academic, um, study abroad, those kinds of exchanges so that people can experience Israel for themselves and uh, to just send the message that that kind of anti-Semitism is absolutely unacceptable. So we've seen We've seen victories in all of our regions, and I'm sure Jonathan and Marlene can talk to the victories they've seen in theirs. Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you, Orr. Um, just to share a very recent victory, actually, of ZOA that took place just the other week at UC Davis. As I'm sure many of you all know, um, the UC system has been a hotbed for so many years of uh, anti-Israel activity and anti-Semitism directed against Jewish students. And unsurprisingly, they mm. BDS resolution uh, very recently. Um, but one of our amazing student leaders who is a ZOA fellow, who actually was a participant as well on the ZOA student leadership mission just this winter, she played a crucial role in working with um, the president of student government and eventually that decision, the BDS resolution was vetoed. So that was really all on behalf of the amazing work of the students we work with and we're, we're so proud of um, for doing the incredible work and mobilizing the community building partnerships, and it really speaks to what our work is about. You know, we are about uh, building allyships and coalitions and working with partners and really trying to spread, you know, forgive me for using the term, but spread the love of Zionism, spread what uh, it really means. And as much uh, as it is to, you know, speak about all of the tough issues, but you know, we, we really want to present something positive as well. It doesn't mean we shy away from the hard questions where, you know, I think ZOA represents the most unique space because we do answer those and we do put those at the forefront time and again, where other organizations often shy away from that. But, you know, we're, we're here really to uh, create partnerships and we've done really amazing work, um, even at schools that have been quite difficult in the past. You know, we've hosted programs here in the Boston area, ZOA led programs at schools like Harvard and Tufts and BU, um, Northeastern. Um, you know, proud to really build relationships with the strong Hillels um, who are doing openly Zionist programming. And, you know, we're working in a tough environment, as you all recognize, but, um, you know, doing our best and, you know, constantly thinking ahead and thinking forward. And I think it's really important. I just want to mention this one point is that we cannot uh, vacate the space to build partnerships with uh, important, not to say important, but with other um, minority groups and other allies on campus, no matter what, you know, there are so many differences out there, but at the end of the day, grassroots relationship building, when people know that you're genuine, know that you're a good person, know that Israel is an integral part of your identity, something that you care about, that resonates. You know, we're not here just to tell them, hey, you need to support Israel because X, Y, and Z. 
you know, we have the facts on our sides, but it really starts with the personal outreach. And that's what uh, our campus department has been doing a great job of for, for a long, long time. And, you know, we value um, all of the students out there from different communities, and we really try to work with all of them. So we Excellent. support. Excellent. Marlene, what about the campuses you deal with? Uh... Yeah, I'm happy to share some victories as well. So my personal favorite, really number one, is ZOA is a huge part of Hebrew Liberation Week at Columbia University. And that is extremely successful. Not only is it directly addressing um, this Israel Apartheid Week, but it's really reinforcing those subconscious connotations that like Hebrew is liberation, like Zionism is liberation. Um, so creating those positive reinforcements. Um, another really successful display that we had is at Binghamton University, which for those that don't know is a little bit further upstate, um, not too far from the border of Pennsylvania. Um, there is a group there that I work with really closely called Bearcats for Israel. And it was one of the unfortunate many times that rockets were fired. Um, at Israel from, from their neighboring countries. And my students found, they took these orange flags, bright orange flags, and they put them in the ground and stood overnight. This display appeared overnight, put them in the ground and in the morning they were there and it was right in front of the main quad on campus, right in front of the main building. And they stood there with signs like each, um, each orange flag represents a rocket that just hit Israel, right? So we're not, we're no longer using these facts as like in hindsight as, oh, well, when this thing happened, we're showing as much as we can what the situation is on the ground here right now on campus in present time. So that was also super, uh, super successful. The videos of the students went fairly viral. So that is also something I'm really, really proud about um, and really taking proactive action. Excellent. Now, uh, it's winter break in the middle of the semester or between semesters and then, you know, the son or daughter comes home and uh, starts mouthing all these anti-Israel sentiments. You know, yes, mom or dad, you know, why are you so pro-Israel? Israel's terrible, don't you know? What, what is a parent or a grandparent or a sibling to do? Do they have a role to play in, in talking to the kids or the grandkids or the, or the siblings about some of these issues uh, and trying to um, turn the kids back around the right way? I mean, I think, of course, parents have a role, like real Jewish education happens in the home and there's no real replacement for that outside. Um, and young adults might want to rebel. They want, might want to find their own path in some ways. Um, and so I think there's a real need for, for Jewish education that is like, it's of course important to have religion and good values and that will solve a lot of the issues. But it's also important to show like the real history, the, the archaeology that goes back thousands of years and the other aspects of Judaism that are connected to Israel, the culture, the society, and build that sense of tribe and community because a lot of it is about competing social forces. So if you have a social force at your university that is pressuring you to be anti-Zionist, then the social forces of your community have to be stronger than that, essentially. And I think a lot of that is also requires some amount of delving into the complexity and addressing the competing narratives honestly. So I think there's a little bit of a danger of when Jews go to university, they have a like a childlike appreciation of Judaism. They see it in terms of the like David and Goliath stories or you know the really just a oversimplified view of Jewish history. And so when they're shown some of the, the realities of the situation where obviously people are gonna get hurt, people are gonna die, and there's like, there are really compelling stories in, in isolation that you can look at. And if they don't have any sense of that, it sends people, like they, they don't have a bearing anymore. And that's one of the key issues. So another one of If Not Now's campaigns is to like, discredit major Jewish institutions like Camp Ramah. They say like, you never told us about the occupation. And it was like, okay, maybe they, they didn't delve into it sufficiently because they were trying to paint a really simplistic picture of Israel. It's Israel always the, get, the, the good guys, never the bad guys. And I think if you are able to actually delve into the complexity of it, Israel obviously comes out as the good guy, but these things aren't childlike anymore. It's an adult view of what good and evil really look like. And it, it, it's like a vaccine. It inculcates the 
child against messages that would otherwise overwhelm them. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, it looked like you wanted to add something. Sure. I'll be happy to add, or I, I think really hit it so excellently there. Um, there's so many dynamics in play, but I, I think for parents and for you know anyone uh, with a family who has young um, teenagers or, or children, it, it really does start um, within the home, but at the same time, uh, we need to be able to equip them really with the tools to be answer the, to be able to answer these tough questions when they get to campus. And I think when we do present sometimes like an overly simplistic sort of knee jerk reaction when it comes to conversations about Israel, we're not providing them with those tools. And I think uh, our department, we really do our best to, to help allow them to have those nuanced conversations that are of course Zionist and are of course pro Israel in their messages when they get to campus, but to really fill in the blanks um, you know, Israel is such an incredible, uh, but also complex place. They need, to be under, they need to be able to understand these complexities. They need to be under, able to understand how to communicate them to others who may uh, have differing views or people outside of the Jewish community. Um, I think that's also really where it starts, um, being able to step outside of the sort of the comfort zone of our own community, being able to engage with others. Um, but it all, a lot of it really does come back down to simple rebellion, I believe. I think uh, parent, children initially will just want to rebel against what their parents are saying. So um, it's, it's about really being open with them, being able to have honest conversations and not compromising on where we stand at all. That's not what it's about, but it's you know, really providing them with uh, the tools to be able to come to campus and meet new people and answer hard questions. I want to uh, give a tip of my hat to Steve Levy from our area, who's sitting watching with his son next to him. Uh, so thank you, Steve. Uh, very important and, and very good of you to be there with your son. So that's wonderful to see. And if there's others uh, like that right now, I don't, I don't see you, but, but thank you if your son or daughter is, is with you watching this. Uh, it's very important. The groups that we talked about uh, earlier, if not now, J Street U, SJP, JVP, are most of them um, student-driven or faculty-driven or administration-driven? Where do they come from? Who supports them financially? Do they get campus funds? Uh, let's talk about some of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes with those groups. Sure, I'm happy to start it off. So they are majority campus-driven. It varies a little bit from campus to campus depending on individual campus policy. So on most campuses, you need some kind of advisor. Now that varies if you get to pick your own, your own advisor that's also a professor or some larger universities actually have departments and those advisors play, on those large campuses, those advisors play a much smaller role where it's purely administrative to make sure like your paperwork is in on time um, and, and that sort of thing. If the group is properly registered on campus as um, a, an official campus group, similar to any of the Zionist groups that we have, then they do receive campus funds, assuming they submit their, their paperwork accordingly. Um, they receive the same amount as any other group, their size or in that. Some, some, some campuses also divide their after school activities in different categories. So like the arts or politics or whatever. So they would be given the same amount of funds as a group their size in their given category. Um, in terms of faculty support, it's usually, I, I don't find that it's usually a faculty member that is starting the group, um, but they do have advisors. The other thing to note is there, these are also national organizations. So there is, again, depending on the size of the group, they also have national support and could be receiving funds or speakers or so on from other national groups. There is also the, Sometimes what happens is they're not able to form on campus properly because they don't have a large enough membership or because of the time frame of when you were supposed to apply. So oftentimes they function out of other groups. So I, at Stony Brook University, for example, I've seen them currently functioning under the College Democrats. So there are like four or five members of the College Democrats that use the College Democrat resources and space to meet specifically about SJP issues. I've also seen similar things um, where they're using the Muslim Students Association and using their resources until they're able to be formally on campus as kind of like hiding out there until they're ready to formally be a group. Jonathan or Orr, uh, anything to add on that topic, whether they're student-driven or 
getting campus funds uh, to, to do the anti-Israel and the Jew hatred activities? I think it's, it's largely student driven. Um, again, it, it does depend campus by campus, which is why it's so important to stay involved as an alumni or in your community with the schools that your child or the students that are in your community know best. Um, but I'd also say there, there's a, a bit of a symbiotic relationship, especially in certain departments. Um, and these are generally more in the humanities. Oftentimes these are, for lack of a better term, like the, the diversity departments. So like in the African American studies or the women's studies department. Um, so not in generally in the STEM departments. A good example of this is at GW. Um, the Elliott School, which is where the political science is based, and it's in DC, so it's a fairly influential one. Their interim president is like a very far left-wing Jew who like definitely speaks against Zionism and is very in favor of BDS. And they have in the past year invited uh, figures like Norman Finkelstein to speak on campus, and they will whip up more support among students um, from the perspective of this is an accomplished member of academia. And so these things are just, and then more students will want to invite speakers like that. So it, it can be a very symbiotic relationship where those things really encourage each other. And it can be difficult for um, Zionist students to break into that, mostly because um, the like Zionists generally don't go into those fields and is as high of numbers as uh, anti-Zionists. So I find a lot of the Zionist students that we work with, it's a real pull to get them to engage in, in, uh, in activism because they're in the business school, they're doing engineering, um, and they are swamped with, with work that is not in the political sphere at all. Um, they're not bringing in speakers, they don't have guest speakers come talk about political issues. They, you know, are not interested in that in their academic studies. And so these things all start to bleed into each other in the anti-Israel sphere of academia. If anybody has a question, there's, there's a lot of chat going on, but if you have a question, type it in now. We are gonna try and get to uh, a couple of them before we close. Uh, President Trump issued an executive order earlier this year to try and protect Jewish students against the hostile campuses uh, environments. Uh, can you share what some of the students have confided in you about how tough it is to be openly pro-Israel on a campus? Can you share just how bad it is in some places? Because I don't know that we really have a sense of, of how it is. So I can share actually my personal story, which is really why I work for ZOA. And it started when I was a senior at Hunter College. And there was, and I was also one of those Zionist students who like my Zionism was my own. It was about my connection with Israel. And my degree was about me getting a degree and um, you know, using that to start a career. And I, it was very incidental that I had a class at the same time that there was a SJP rally that was calling for a few things, but essentially it was like the cancellation of student debt, um, a $15 minimum wage, and BDS. So things that for in me, like in my mind were like, these are not at all connected whatsoever, but if in that intersectional way, the SJP can uh, glob onto another cause, they will try to insert that or try to make it for a space that scientists can't be a part of. Um, and so I had one of my friends was standing at this rally, feeling very uncomfortable, feeling like things were getting hostile towards them because they're uh, a Jewish student, they're a Zionist student, and so they wanted some support, and so we went to go stand with them, and somebody else, another Zionist student, wanted to go to the Hillel, because they had a Israeli flag in the Hillel, and they wanted to bring that to, like, show that, you know, we're not going to be cowed by this, like, we, there are Zionist students who aren't going to accept the, that BDS is going to be added to every kind of student movement on campus, and this is kind of where you have those two, those two things. You have like the attractive pull of the uh, anti-Zionist intersectional movement and then the weakness of some of the Jewish institutions on campus. The Hillel was unwilling to lend us their Israeli flag because they didn't want to get involved in campus politics. And so like, we were like, okay, 
we, we like quickly went to like CVS and we made a bunch of signs that said that we were Zionists, but it was like a real slap in the face of, um, from the Hillel to students who like were part of the Hillel who wanted their support when things got hard. Um, and so I think that discouraged so many students who were like part of the Hillel, Jewish and like casually Zionist from taking part in it because they realized, oh, like they have institutional support, they have allies, and we are going to be out there like making our own signs that we buy with our own money with markers and, you know, like quickly cobbled together. And it was like, it was very unacceptable. Luckily, we were able to really like change things that year. And um, we were able to do some of the techniques that, that ZOA encourages with other members. And we were able to splinter the SJP group into like the ones who didn't want to be associated with like the really vile open anti-Semitism that was present at that rally and the ones who didn't want to associate with that. So it's a good example of how difficult it can be. And it's also an example of some of the techniques that can be used to um, adopt some of the more effective activist and coalition building techniques that we need on campus. Friends, we're going to run a little over because of the importance of this topic, so please uh, hang in there with us. Uh, a question from Mike Perloff. How do you challenge the phony propaganda terminology used by anti-Israel organizations on the campuses to influence Jewish students? What, what are some of the techniques that ZOA campus uh, teaches the students? Sure, um, I'll be happy to take that. For one, it really starts with knowing your history. For one, when we hear terms like the West Bank just being commonly used um, really throughout uh, discourse, understanding, allowing them to understand why do we refer to these areas as Judea and Samaria, um, providing that context for the students to understand that the roots of the Jewish people go back to places like Hebron, places like Shechem, and allowing them to understand why these areas are <clears throat> Are, are called a certain way, but um, you know, it, it goes more than that. I, I do think we need to sort of understand when and where to pick our battles. Um, but at the same time, we cannot shy away from providing like the right educational context, which we do uh, constantly for the students. Um, we, we don't want to shame anyone. You know, many people, many of these young students, you know, might just sort of um, be so used to hearing terminology like the West Bank um, or like just Palestinians. And then, you know, we do help provide them in a really like open and understanding way for them to really get a better sense of these terms of what they mean and why for us as Jews and as Israelis, like why for us, it's really important to use different terms. Um, as I mentioned, like saying, you know, Judea and Samaria, Judea and Shemron, um, and speaking about the Jewish roots of these areas, which predate, as we know, um, Islam and, you know, it, it's so critical for us to make the students aware that Jews are indigenous to the land of Israel. These are our roots. Uh, we have always been from this land. We've had a continuous presence, even when we've been expelled and uh, we are not going anywhere. And I think that's very, very important for them to, to understand. So we do it in a, in a way that they can really um, hopefully understand it easily. And it's something that we, we do constantly. Uh, Marty Zukoff uh, sent a question by email. I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. Uh, are, are university administrators uh, and administration still allowing uh, pro-Israel events on campus to be uh, disrupted? Uh, and, and why don't they do anything about that? I'm happy to actually chime in. I feel bad talking back to back, but there are two instances that just popped into my head um, that really occurred during my first year in this line of work. Um, they happened both at Hillel's and they both involved um, pro-Israel events being disrupted. And I was um, a participant in both of those. Um, the first one took place at BU Hillel. We had an event that was co-sponsored by other partners and it was sort of a follow-up for students who have been on Birthright, who came back, who are looking to learn about more opportunities to go back to Israel, such as the ZOA student leadership mission and other ways to get involved. Really a completely apolitical event. But... Students from SJP uh, showed up. They started initially being disruptive from the very beginning, and they were given a lot of leeway, a lot of leeway. Um, we offered them to, you know, please join us, but, you know, of course, behave in a civil manner. They refused to do so. Instead, they started running around the hallways with banners, screaming at Jewish students, 
your government supports apartheid and harassing them directly. And I remember, you know, approaching them and telling them, what do you mean your government supports apartheid? These are Jewish students who are here to learn about Israel in Hillel. Um, you have no right to do that. And, you know, it, it really uh, just raised the octane level. And myself as someone, you know, I serve in the IDF. I'm a dual Israeli citizen as well. Um, you know, please talk to me. But like outright anti-Semitism in a Hillel cannot be tolerated. Unfortunately, the response from Hillel was really uh, much to be desired. Um, the students from SJP accused BU Hillel of being racist because they were eventually kicked out after disturbing the event. And then, uh, not surprisingly, the Hillel sort of walked it back and issued a very soft statement to appease them. Um, and I don't want to paint Hillel entirely uniformly. There are many, many great chapters, and we're proud to work with a lot of them. But unfortunately, um, this mindset really is prevalent among a lot of them, and it's certainly not a way to make Jewish students feel safe or empower them. Um, but others, such as Northeastern Hillel, who are an amazingly strong ally of ours, they've done great work and we're you know, really proud of them. But it's, it's a difficult environment and that's why it really comes down to us and the work that we do with ZOA and especially with Susan Tuckman to help defend students and support them in instances like this. But it's very troubling when it happens within the Jewish community. But even outside of the Hillel, in a, in a regular open campus event, uh, with you know, when Michael Lauren, for example, spoke out in California, one of the colleges, the administration seemed to let that be disrupted uh, and, and create mayhem, mayhem so that he couldn't even talk. I mean, why, yeah, I is think, that, why is that permitted? I think it, it, it's a difficult problem, actually, and it's mostly because it's kind of the, the constant security problem. Like, we have to be everywhere, and they just have to be somewhere where we're not. So even if you got security for every event, which is prohibitively expensive in a lot of cases, and that's kind of the point. So if they can send in a few disruptors to any event, which is really low cost for them, then the anticipation of that and the response to that is, okay, well, we need security, we need to check, we need to make sure that this doesn't turn violent. And that can be a big issue. People aren't, gonna wanna, aren't going to want to host events that are much more expensive. They might not want to host them on campus. I know of events that have had to move off campus into like safer community venues because the campus environment, they knew there were going to be disruptors. They knew they weren't going to be able to speak. And so the disruption is, is I mean, it's technically legal in a lot of senses, like especially if these are public venues where people are ex like exercising their right to protest, exercise their right to free speech. And it's not so much about um, making it illegal. It's just about raising the cost for students who have views that they consider unacceptable. What about the free speech of the speaker who was invited to campus? Uh, I mean, it becomes an issue of like who can drown out who and that, that's not that's not a way to convince people. And so like a lot of times you have to head that out at the pass and like this is why like policies like anti-normalization are so problematic because we have been able to engage people who have like really widely different views than us and have productive conversations that, you know, humanize both sides to the other. And like, even if it's incremental progress, bring people from staunchly anti-Zionist positions over. Um, but if you don't do that groundwork of building those alliances and making it unacceptable for activists to do that in your spaces, then it's, it's hard to combat that. And there's not a policy that doesn't, in a sense, martyr those disruptors and those protesters. Because if you're going to do kind of what they want you to do, which is they want you to arrest them and they want to get video footage of that and to show how, you know, repressive the Zionist students are, how the Zionists control the administration and the police force and all of these other heinous connections. So you, you don't want to play that game at all. And you want to head that off at the pass. So... Um, there are a lot of alternatives and especially like I think that's something that we've noticed moving into the virtual space that there are a lot of ways that you can deal with that that um, are actually even even better in some ways you know like on, on this zoom call like we, we don't do it we want people to be able to exercise free things but like you can mute every participant on a zoom call if you so choose so that everybody else can can listen to it and the disruptors are are barred so like there are ways that don't infringe on anybody's first amendment rights of building much more lasting relationships that affect uh, opinions in a much more positive way than trying to shout down disruptors or trying to have them 
arrested or anything like that. I want to encourage everybody uh, watching uh, this evening, and, and I'm, I'm sure you're enjoying this and learning a lot, to please make a donation uh, to ZOA, the Zionist Organization of America. If you live in eastern Pennsylvania, southern New Jersey, Delaware, please make a donation to our chapter. If you live where there are other ZOA chapters, please support your local chapter. Uh, otherwise, please support National ZOA. Our email address in Philadelphia is the word office at zoaphilly.org. And our website is www.philly.zoa.org. And there is a tab there to donate. For information about National ZOA, please go to info at zoa.org. And the website for National ZOA is www.zoa.org. We've got a couple more Zoom events coming up this week, uh, Sunday, which I guess is next week. A uh, virtual event for Sovereignty Now featuring National ZOA President Moore Klein, journalist Caroline Glick, Pastor Lori Cordoza Moore. That's taking place Sunday at 2 p.m. I'm sure ZOA will be sending out information about that, so please check your email. And then on Sunday at 7 p.m., my colleague Dan Pollack is going to be hosting a uh, webinar called What Congress Needs to Know About Judea and Samaria. And it's co-hosted by the North Carolina Coalition for Israel and the Raleigh Cary Jewish Community Center. So thanks to them for co-hosting. I wanna thank my colleagues, Jonathan, Orr, Marlene, wonderful. Each of you really are champions. Uh, and as I like to say about some of the younger people, you are not only our future, but also our present. So thank you for the great work uh, that you're doing in the trenches. I hope everybody uh, enjoyed the event tonight and benefited and learned. We're gonna have this on YouTube. The link will go out via email. So please share the link with people who could not be there today. And also uh, if you've got uh, children, grandchildren, siblings, nieces, nephews, college age, please have them go to campus.zoa.org to see what our campus department is doing, all the good deeds uh, and good work that we're doing and great materials. I want to thank you all for watching. I want to wish everybody well and have a good evening.